Hello, everybody, and welcome back to BioSC 140 Human Physiology. This video is for S3P1 blood. This is lecture material exam three. This, is, this video is going to be an overview of blood. So the cardiovascular system has three main components. It has your heart, it has vessels, and it has blood. So let's look at this word cardiovascular. So it's an anatomical name. Cardia refers to heart, vascular refers to vessels. Uh, you all by now know the, how important I think it is to know the roots of words, to be able to break down words. So cardiovascular, heart, and vessels. A functional name for this system is the circulatory system. It circulates blood and all of the contents within that blood. Three main components, heart, vessels, and blood. So the pump, the tubes, and the stuff that moves through those tubes. Blood performs several essential functions. So when the general public thinks of blood, you know, and what it does, you know, they think of it as a transport system. They think of it as transporting oxygen. Some people might think of it as transporting nutrients, sugar, carbon dioxide. Uh, most people will think of it as moving oxygen around our bodies, though. Uh, so it moves gases, uh, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide. It moves nutrients, so we've talked a lot about blood sugar. So it moves glucose. It also moves amino acids, lipids, uh, the different macromolecules that our, our body needs to function. You know, it, ha it has to get to the cells somehow, and the circulatory system is the highway that brings those, those molecules, those building blocks of biomolecules to our cells. Uh, we've talked about hormones. So a hormone is a chemical that's produced in one part of the body that sends a signal to a distant part of the body, and they use the circulatory system to travel to those distant parts of the body. Uh, move water around and to move waste products around. Another important function is protection, immunity. So we're gonna talk about the different types of blood cells in this series of lectures. And you know, everybody knows about the red blood cells that help carry you know, oxygen around our blood. We're gonna talk a lot about those, but we're also gonna talk a lot about white blood cells or leukocytes. And they are part of our immune system. So our blood is a very, very, very important part of our immune system help to produce and transport immune cells, white blood cells. It also, blood also plays an important role in stopping bleeding, in preventing and in, in clotting. When we get a, a cut into our circulatory system, blood has various mechanisms. <laughs> Number three, this goes all the way back to our very first day in class. All the way back to our first day in class when I showed you a picture of a bunny rabbit. And I told you to look very closely at the ears of that bunny rabbit and to tell me what you saw. Temperature regulation. The circulatory system plays an important role in maintaining core temperature. Our bodies can, so when we have a lot of blood near the surface of our body, we're gonna exchange heat more rapidly with the environment. And changing blood flow to certain parts of our body can help regulate temperature. Like that rabbit can send more blood to its ears if it wants to exchange heat faster with the environment or send less blood to its ears if they want to slow that rate down. So what's going on right here? What's going on right here in this photo in the bottom right? What do you notice? 
well, there's some, some pretty pale fingers right here. So what's going on in this photo? So most students can see that blood flow has been restricted into the fingers in this person's hand. Blood flow is normal in the palm and in the thumb, but it's restricted to the fingers. Uh, this is a picture of something called Raynaud's phenomenon. And it's a situation where blood flow is cut down. Blood flow is reduced uh, to certain parts of the body. So blood is a highly viscous fluid. Blood is a highly viscous fluid. So high viscosity means something's really thick. So like honey has a high viscosity. Honey is really thick. It, it flows slowly. Low viscosity is something that's able to, to move more easily. So blood's a little bit sticky. It's a little bit thick. It has a high viscosity. And that's actually, it, it can be a good thing and a bad thing. It can be a good thing and a bad thing. It's good because it slows blood loss. You know, you get a paper cut and the blood doesn't leak out too fast. It's bad because it makes it more difficult to circulate through your body. So think about drinking a soda or water through a straw. It's fairly easy to move that soda up the straw into your mouth or move that water up the straw into your mouth low viscosity. Now think about trying to drink a thick milkshake through a straw. It's tough. You got to work at it. You got to work to get that milkshake up the straw. High viscosity is the milkshake. So imagine your heart trying to push that milkshake through your vessels. It's not going to work very well, right? So higher viscosity can cause issues for your cardiovascular system. It can make your heart work harder, makes your cardiovascular system work harder. It can lead to high blood pressure, hypertension. But you gotta have some level of viscosity to help avoid smoking. Smoking can increase the viscosity. So that's why this photo's here. Don't do this, please. So smoking increases the thickness of when you increase the thickness of your blood, it's gonna make your circulatory system work harder, it's gonna increase your blood pressure, it's gonna cause hypertension. Is it good to I'm gonna talk about this, I'm gonna mention this a bunch of times throughout these lectures, but is it good to exercise your heart? Is it good to go for a jog, you know, 60 minutes, three or four times a week? Absolutely, it's great for your heart to do some, some level of cardiovascular exercise. What hypertension does is it makes your heart work harder every moment of every day. Your heart never gets a break. Like it is constantly working every moment of every day. And when you have excessively viscous blood, when you have excessively high blood pressure, eventually it's, it's going to tire out your heart. It's not good. So general characteristics of blood, it's about 50% water, about 50% water, about 0.9% salt, so it's fairly salty. pH, slightly basic, 7.35 to 7.45. It's a little bit on the low end of that uh, in the venous side because of increased levels of CO2, remember CO2 when it dissolves in a liquid, can make it more acidic. Contents plasma is about 60%. So our blood is gonna have, we're gonna kind of break up, so we have blood, and we're gonna split it into kind of two components. The liquid component and the solid component. The liquid component and the solid component. So we have our blood, split it into two parts. The liquid component, we're gonna call plasma. Plasma is the liquid component of blood. It's about 60% of our blood. And then the solid component. The solid component is called the formed elements. 
It's about 40% of our blood. Now, these numbers vary a little bit. We're going to get into that in a little bit about how they can vary. Um, but it's a good ballpark numbers. These would be typical numbers, but they can vary. So of the solid parts or formed elements, we're going to have red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. So we're going to have actually have three names for red blood cells that you're going to see. And you know, I'm really important. I think it's really important for you to know all, all the terminologies. I think it's really important for you to speak physiology and speak healthcare. So I definitely expect you to know all of the names for red blood cells. So we're going to have red blood cell, we have RBC, and we're also going to have erythrocyte. You're going to see that coming up shortly, erythrocyte. Uh, white blood cell, or WBC, or leukocyte. Um, the way I remember that is, you know, once again, you know, knowing the root of words and being able to break words down. Um, many people in this class have probably been athletes growing up, or just athletes, and a lot of you have probably done or even done um, sports medicine in high school or had some sports medicine training. And many of you are probably familiar with something called leukotape. Well, what color is leukotape? It's white. It's white tape. Leukocyte, white cell, white blood cell. Uh, and then platelets are the other formed elements. Um, I do expect you, so in this lecture, in the blood lectures, there are numbers that you need. When you see pH numbers, when you see salt content numbers, uh, I do expect you to know those numbers for the exam. So just a heads up on that. Take special notes, make flashcards, and study them. Speaking of numbers, water constitutes the majority of our total body weight. When we're infants, when we're little tiny babies, when we're little infants, about 80% of our body is water. And that percentage goes down with age. Middle age, it gets to around 60%. And elderly people, it finishes up around 55% of our body is water. So a mythical male would just be a hypothetical male, a hypothetical person. So someone who's 154 pounds or 72 kilograms. Now, this person, mythical, hypothetical, middle-aged, we take their weight, 72 kilograms, and we times it by 60%, and we get 42 kilograms. So 42 kilograms worth of water in that person's body. Now, one kilogram of water is roughly, approximately one liter of water, just kind of by definition. So 42 kilograms of water is equal to about 42 liters of water. So a person who weighs 154 pounds or 72 kilograms has roughly 42 liters of water in their body. Now, I've talked a lot about compartments and the importance of compartmentalization throughout this semester. And we're going to continue to talk about it. So your body contains uh, several fluid-filled compartments. About two-thirds of your water is intracellular fluid. So fluid inside of cells. Only about two-thirds of your water is inside of cells. So inside of cells. About one third or 14 liters of fluid is outside of cells. It's extracellular fluid, ECF, outside of cells. If you break down that one third of your like water, the water that's within a body, if you look at that a little more closely, you can break it down the extracellular fluid to a few more compartments. You can do interstitial fluid interstitial fluid. So that's the fluid that's kind of around our cell, that's bathing our cells, but not in our bloodstream. About 10 to 11 liters is interstitial fluid. Interstitial fluid. About three liters is plasma, the liquid portion of our blood. And 
zero to one liters is transcellular. So transcellular fluid is gonna be your cerebral spinal fluid. It's gonna be, which kind of bathes, which kind of, yeah, bathes and sits around your uh, central nervous system. And it's also going to be uh, synovial fluid. So the fluid within your joints. Total blood volume is equal to plasma plus formed elements. We have about five to 5.5 liters of blood. So total blood volume, plasma plus formed elements, or just the plasma is about three liters. When you add in the formed elements, you have about five to 5.5 liters. So let's look at some examples. Uh, blood volume varies with body weight. So job of the hut right here is really big. He weighs about a thousand kilograms. A good way to estimate blood volume is about 8% of a person's body weight in kilograms. So job of the hut weighs a thousand kilograms, 1000 times 8% or 0 .8, 0 0.08, sorry, 0 0.08. It's gonna be about 80 liters of blood. Salacious crumb, that's this, this character over here. Weighs about 20 kilograms, 20 times 0 0.08, 1.6 liters. Ula, right here, weighs about 60 kilograms, 60 times 0 0.08, you get about 4.8 liters of blood. So you should be able to calculate the uh, amount of blood within a person from their body weight in kilograms. Um, expect a question or two about that on the exam. So I have asked those questions before. All right, so how do you separate blood? How do you separate the formed elements from the plasma? How do you separate the liquid portion of our blood from the solid portion of our blood? Well, centrifugation separates blood components. Putting your blood into a centrifuge will separate the solid components from the liquid components. Now, if we do this in lab, we'll, we'll talk about this in lab. Uh, we would actually do this if we were in person in lab. But, you know, basically you get blood in a tiny tube, a little tube, and you spin it really, 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 really fast. And all of the formed elements, all of the red blood cells will pack to the, will get pushed to the outside because it's in tropical force. And they'll get packed down at the end of the tube. And all of the liquid, the plasma, will be sitting on top of it. And so before you put the, the tube in the centrifuge, you know, it'll look like classic blood color throughout. After you centrifuged it, you'll see a, kind of a dark red outer part, or the part that was to the outside of the centrifuge. And then this like off white, it looks actually kind of like, kind of close to this color. It's like an off white, yellowish, darkish yellowish uh, color that sits on top, that's the plasma. The plasma is the liquid component. Red blood cells or RBCs, right here we see the other term, erythrocyte. Remember, all three of these terms, you can see it in your future, in this class, you know, I'll be talking, I'll be using all three of these words. And in your professional careers, you're also gonna encounter all three of these terms. It's important that you know them all. So red cell, erythrocyte means red cell. Again, break the words down, it's really important, it helps Understanding the roots of words really helps you succeed in healthcare and science and physiology. And I'm gonna to continue to do it throughout the whole semester, so be ready. Uh, about 95% of the formed elements. So formed elements, you know, in this example, formed elements are about 42% of the whole blood. Of the formed elements, 95% of them are red blood cells. Now, it's not 95% of whole blood, just 95% of the formed elements. Sometimes that throws students off. I've seen students get messed up, uh, mixed up on that in, in the past. So it's 95% of the formed elements. So 
plasma is around 60%, formed elements around 40%, 95% of those formed elements, red blood cells. Now, I told you that 60-40 number, it, it varies some, depending on the number of factors from the person to, uh, you know, if, if how much water they've drank in recently, how hydrated they are, there's a number of things that can alter that number. In this example right here, we can see plasma volume is 58, so slightly less than 60. The reds, the packed cell volume is 42, so a little bit more than 40. But 95% of those formed elements are red blood cells. There's about 5 million per microliter. Microliter, 5 million per microliter. There's a lot of red cells in a person's body. Uh, red cells, their function is to carry O2. Um, so oxygen, we'll look into this later, but oxygen doesn't dissolve well in water. Like you can't dissolve a lot of oxygen in water. And red blood cells help increase the amount of oxygen that your blood can carry. You know, and that's, that's what they're famous for. That's what they do. Red blood cells help move oxygen around your bloodstream. So white blood cells, WBCs, or leukocyte, white cell, uh, their function is immunity. Uh, they help protect your body from bacteria, from parasites. They clean up old cell debris. Uh, you know, if, if there's crazy fires going on in California, you're breathing in all this smoke, they'll help protect your lungs from all those smoke particles. So function is immunity. There's lots of different types. We'll learn about them later on in this lecture series. Uh, you have around 5,000 to 10,000 per microliter. Around 5,000 to 10,000 per microliter. Uh, platelets. Platelets. So platelets help with clotting. So if there is a cut, if there's a hole in your tubes, in your vessels, uh, platelets help plug that hole. They help clog that hole. Thrombocyte is a clotting cell. Thrombocyte is a clotting cell. You have around 200,000 to 400,000 per microliter. Plasma is primarily composed of water. So these are that 40% that formed elements, right? This next slide, we're just looking at the plasma. We're looking at the 60%. We're looking at this part up here on this next following slide, okay? Once again, students sometimes get that mixed up. We're looking at just this plasma part up here now. So plasma is primarily composed of water. It's 50 to 60% of whole blood. Again, you see this number varies some. It's like a ballpark number, but you know, it can go up and down throughout the day, depending on what you do between people. So it's, it's fluctuates around there. Plasma is around 90 plus percent water. So if you just take the plasma portion, you just take the plasma portion of blood, it's around 90 plus percent water, about 8% protein. So albumins, gamma globulins, fibrinogen, and carrier proteins. And around 2% everything else. So ions, gases, nutrients, others. So right here is all plasma, 90 plus percent water, 8% proteins, 2% ions, gases, nutrients. Those of that 8% protein, you can break it up into albumins, gamma globulins, fibrinogens, and carriers. Let's look at these proteins, this 8%, a little bit closer. All right, so albumins are critical osmotic regulators. They're the majority of plasma proteins, so of that 8% right here, around 60% of that are albumins. Now, albumins do two main things. They increase viscosity. They increase viscosity of our blood, and they contribute to osmotic pressure. They contribute to osmotic pressure, so colloid osmotic pressure. This is 
the solution to pollution is dilution. This is pulling water and keeping water within our bloodstream so that it doesn't leak out. It helps pull fluid into our capillaries and it prevents edema. So this photo down here, you can see this person has a pretty normal leg here and then this swollen leg. This person has really bad edema. There's water leaking out of her, of her circulatory system and collecting in her interstitial fluid causing this swelling. Gamma globulins are essential for immune response. So gamma globulins are a subclass of serum protein. They include immunoglobulins, antibodies. They provide protection from foreign invaders and they are the most varied blood protein. So a specific antibody for each pathogen. So antibodies have a they bind onto extremely specific things. So right here, it says specific antibody for each pathogen. Really, it's, it's specific antibody for a specific part of a specific protein on a specific pathogen. Like they're really, really, really specialized and focused and specific about what they bind to. So they'll bind to a specific part of a specific protein on a specific pathogen, like super selective of where they, where they bind. And when they bind to things, they increase the likelihood that a white blood cell is going to come up and gobble them up. Um, they kind of get marked for, for a white cell to come by and, and clean up that, that issue when uh, these bind to them. And they can also just kind of mess up the function of these pathogens just by the binding of themselves also. They can kind of you know, form and function. It's like throwing a screwdriver in your engine, right? Kind of plugs them up. So they can work in a couple different ways. Uh, fibrinogen is essential for clotting. So we saw this ogen, we've seen this kind of part of a word before. We saw it with pepsin and pepsinogen. So fibrinogen is the inactive soluble precursor. So fibrinogen is always floating through our body. And fibrinogen will change into fibrin when it comes across a specific chemical signal. When fibrin is insoluble and it forms like a net for a clot to form on, so fibrinogen, soluble, inactive, floating around our bloodstream, when we get a cut in our circulatory system, certain chemical signals are released. When fibrinogen is exposed to those chemical signals, it turns to fibrin. Fibrin is insoluble and it forms a net. It kind of, it's this, this pink net that we see here, and it forms a clot over that cut. Carrier proteins are necessary to transport hydrophobic molecules. So as we just learned, our blood is mostly water, but we still need to transport nonpolar hydrophobic molecules and substances within our bloodstream. And carrier proteins help us do that. Carrier proteins transport hydrophobic, so lipid, molecules in aqueous blood. We've actually heard about these before when we talked about lipid-based hormones. We said they needed carrier proteins. Well, cholesterol needs carrier proteins. Steroids, cholesterol-derived hormones need carrier proteins. Cholesterol-derived uh, um, hormones need carrier proteins to help them move through the bloodstream. Of free fatty acids. You've probably all heard of high density lipoproteins, low density lipoproteins. They are these carrier proteins. Uh, regulate the availability of certain molecules. So, carrier proteins can also help regulate 
the available levels of certain molecules. So transferrin helps control the level of iron in our blood. If there's excess iron, we can bind onto it, help control the levels of certain ions. Here's the summary chart. Uh, whenever you see a summary chart in these slides, once again, make sure you study it. And I will see you in the next video. Email me if you have any questions. Have a great day, everybody.